Welcome to the Clear the Shelf podcast with Chris and Chris, the show that meets at the intersection of education and entertainment to discuss online arbitrage, retail arbitrage, wholesale, and all facets of selling on Amazon. We'll bring you news, tactics, strategies, insights, stories, and interviews to help you grow your Amazon business. And now, here are your hosts, Chris Grant and Chris Rasick. What is going on, Amazon sellers, and welcome back to the Clear the Shelf podcast with myself and my loquacious co-host, Chris Rasick. Today, we've got a guest I've wanted to have on for uh, for quite some time, uh, Zach Altmeyer or at Zach Altmeyer on Twitter. Uh, he specializes in finding and selling discontinued products on eBay and Amazon. So he hunts down the products in the aisles of mom and pop hardware stores, local pharmacies, and then turns that dust into dinero. Uh, and today, our goal is to get him to give us all the secrets to the uh, huge ROIs that he's able to command on products that are hard to find. But before we dive in, you know the drill. This show isn't free. It may not cost you any money, but if you give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast player or smash the thumbs up on YouTube, uh, it helps us a ton and it gets us back behind the mic to create more shows like this for you people. So please do that if you don't mind. Uh, now, Zach, I appreciate you taking the time to hang out with this man. Uh, I always like to set the table a little bit. And for those who may not know you, can you give us a bit of a background on what got you into reselling? Uh, and specifically, what got you into looking for discontinued products to resell? Yeah, man, absolutely. First and foremost, uh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, I'm pumped to be here. So for those who don't know me, uh, my name's Zach Altmeyer. I've been reselling on the side for about five years now. And I've, I've always wanted a side hustle, uh, something of my own outside of the nine to five. I had a blog, uh, tried drop shipping, nothing ever really stuck with me. And it all started with buying a course called the art of flipping. So shout out to my guy, Joe Hart, Love him. Uh, really where I learned the, the basics of flipping and just kind of understanding of how to list things and, and things of that nature. So. I got things cleared around the house, and just kind of got the experience of listing and shipping items and things like that. So once I kind of cleared the house, then I started hitting up garage sales. And then once that season ended, I, I needed something else and I, I didn't know kind of where else to go. Uh, so I ended up going to my couple of my local stores, clearance sections and I remember going into like Ace Hardware, uh, like my local grocery store and just anything I could get my hands on. So I like was flipping light bulbs, like dog collars. I, I, I specifically remember this security system keychain that I bought. It was like $4 and I sold it for like 19 and I was like, let's go. And it really wasn't about the money. It was just more understanding like the possibility of I could buy something and then make a little bit of money off that by reselling. So once I kind of got through those areas, I went to my local pharmacy and the first thing that I found there was this blue and white vintage looking cream. It was Curedex 71, what it was called. It was like 10 bucks. And I remember being in the pharmacy and just, you know, you open up the eBay app, you check the sold listings and my jaw dropped and was selling for like 70 bucks. And I was like, oh, like, what did I just stumble into? So I sold it the next day, sold it for it was $69 and it was, it was game on after that. So started hit up pharmacies, uh, all my local grocery stores and just trying to find those, those type of products. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, I mean, it becomes addictive at, at one point, you know, uh, it, I don't know. I remember, I remember the first thing, the first thing I ever found where I kind of like, I don't know, hit it big, uh, was a, it was an item from a thrift store that I bought for less than 10. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a PC game and I ended up selling it for over a hundred. Uh, and I don't know, I've never done like crack, but I'm guessing that this feeling is similar. 
understand that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. now I want to I want to start with with a topic that uh, you and I touched on a little bit uh, in in the DMs. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's rather popular right now on Amazon, Twitter, on maybe even Money Twitter as a whole to uh, give the normies, if you will, the people who have nine to fives a hard time. Uh, but I know that you've got a nine to five. Uh, I know that you take salsa lessons. Uh, I have seen your post about navigating the dating scene uh, and you sell things on the internet. Mm-hmm. So how do you manage all of that and, and still kind of feed the addiction of reselling? It's a great question. Um, for me, like I love reselling. It's, it's been a big part of my life over these past few years. It's not everything. Um, for me, my goal is I, I want to live my life to the fullest. I want to experience as much as I can while I'm here. And this year, 2023 has been one of the best years of my life. I can easily say that. Um, from all the activities from scuba diving in Mexico, skydiving with my family, hiked in the Smokies. We won a deck hockey championship, rock climbing in West Virginia, and even dancing to showcases. And a really good friend of mine, Helena, has always said, you know, we're here for a good time in a long time. And we'll dive deep into reselling here in a little bit. I just, I feel it's important to remind whoever is listening that if you want to go do something, like, do not wait. Go do it. Life goes by so fast, and it's so easy to, to lose track of time. And I used to be someone who would wait, wait for opportunity, wait for, you know, the perfect time. And there was a day where I had a mentor uh, John, he had called me out one day and I was just kind of a conversation with him. And it was, I was like, man, like, I love to go to Texas. Like, that'd be, that'd be cool. I've never been. I'd love to go. And he like paused and he was like, Zach, do you hear yourself right now? And I was like, man, I don't, what do you mean? He was like, it's like, then go to Texas. And it sounds stupid. And it, but as for as simple as it was, it kind of changed everything for me. And from there on out, you know, I, I started challenging myself with one question, why not me? And with reselling, it was, you know, if I want to create a profitable side business, why not me? I want to be, you know, that there's that person who brings everyone together. Why can't that be me? They're that guy who does all the crazy adrenaline, skydiving, thrill seeking activities. Why not me? And you mentioned dance, and that was probably one of the biggest. Hey, guys, wanted to take a quick second and thank you for listening to the Clear the Shelf podcast. My magnanimous co-host, Chris Rasick, has put together a gift for you for being a listener. It's called the Monthly Goal Tracking Spreadsheet, and it's free. The spreadsheet will help you break down and track how much you've purchased, which should be a leading indicator of how much you will sell. And then you'll be able to track how much you've sold as well as your estimated monthly profit on a daily basis. This will all feed into the daily averages so you can ensure that you're on track to meet your goals each and every month. Grab it for free today over at cleartheshelf.com forward slash goal dash tracking. Thanks again for being a listener. Now back to the show. Probably the biggest challenges that I've had to overcome because I've never been a dancer in my entire life. And I saw a guy take a girl's hand, you know, lead her at a dance, and he was very confident about it. And again, it came back to me. It was like, why not me? And so, you know, start taking lessons. I can go be that guy. And I want to become that guy. And I'm not where I want yet. I'm on my way with that. And if there's one takeaway from all of this, it's don't be afraid to look foolish trying new things. Um, you will never master it if you aren't willing to spend time being bad at it. And 
that goes for anything in life. And to kind of tie this all together, if you're new to reselling or thinking about starting to resell, or you want to dive into a new niche or whatever it may be, um, like you're going to make mistakes. You're going to feel dumb at times, but that that's how you grow. And that's kind of the mindset that I've had for a while now. And it's been able to push me to do all these different things outside of, you know, reselling and my full-time job. I, I really like that. It, I'd say that reminds me of a conversation that I've been having with my son because he doesn't seem to get it the first time I explain it. Um, yeah, he's, he's really into basketball right now and, uh, but he's not progressing at the speed that he would like to. And I'm like, listen, dude, you need to enjoy this time. Like enjoy the time you're, you're bad at it. I'm like, cause one of these days you're not going to be bad and you're going to miss the time that you had to put in all this work. Uh, and I'm like, I know that doesn't make sense to, to your 10 year old brain. I'm like, but trust me, uh, you'll get to that point where, where you miss like learning something, struggling on purpose. Uh, to get better mm -hmm. at something. So I, I, I like that. And, you know, something else too is, I don't know, if you listen to other podcasts or you listen to people who are at a high level in what they do, uh, a lot of them talk about enjoying the process of sucking, uh, you know, at something that, you know, uh, I was trying to, trying to remember what this guy was talking about. I think he was, I think he was learning how to like do calligraphy or something. He's, he's some, he's, he's worth like $50 million, but he wanted to be bad at something so he could go through the process of work. Uh, and I, I really liked it. So I, I like the way that you put that. Um, uh, although I, I won't ever understand why you would jump out of a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> it is an absolute blast. Yeah, I'll I'll take your word for that too. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> no desire to do that. But uh, no, you know it, it, the answer to your last question. Uh, it, it, it's near and dear to my heart. You know, I, I and I think it's going to resonate uh, with the audience because I think uh, a good portion of the attention that's been brought on to reselling and the amount of sellers that have joined, I think a good portion of those people are people. And, and tie this into the great resignation if you want to, too. It, it, there's been a shift in the mindset of taking back our time, you know, and, and actually doing things that we want to do and kind of having more say over how we live our lives. You know, I, mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a common theme. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate your answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. But, before, we, before we move on to the next question, I've got, an, I've got one more follow-up. Um, just cause I'm, I'm always curious, uh, is, is your reselling business, is it used to fund, you know, the adventures that you want to do? Or, uh, I know for some people it's, you know, I want to stack as much cash as cash as I possibly can. And I want to, uh, you know, fire. And for those who don't know what fire is, it's, uh, oh shoot. What is it? Financial, finance, and financially retire, independent early. And retire early. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, so is it that, or is it a little bit of both? For me, it's a little bit of both. Um, okay. my, my vision for the future is I know I don't, I know I don't want to be, I guess in a corporate life all the way up till 65, I would like to be able to use reselling or whatever it may be in the future. I also. I, I know I want to be a scuba instructor at some point. I think that would be awesome. Nice. So to even help fund Apple, definitely to help one, support me. Um, one, if something does happen with my full-time position, because you never know. But one, to retire early, and yes, absolutely. Just fund those thrill-seeking activities. If there's, I got a whole bucket list for 2024. I got a, I got a big year ahead of me, so... Most of those funds will probably go be going to uh, all the activities. Nice. So, um, if anybody listening isn't following you on Twitter, which number one, first of all, you should be. Um, mm -hmm. You're a good follower. Follow over on X slash Twitter. I'm just going to call it Twitter. And if anybody has a problem with that, just you got to deal with it. Um, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> but uh, but on Twitter, you you play one of my favorite games uh, on the entire platform, uh, where you will take a picture of a shelf, and then you'll ask your followers to find the item that is selling for, for crazy money on an e-commerce platform, usually eBay, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what tips can you give us to make spotting those items easier? And, and what are the most effective strategies for finding discontinued products or finding that treasure? It's a great question. So I have a few strategies that we can talk about and that the listeners can use like right away. So number one, is brand websites. We can use Avino as an example. If you go to their website, scroll all the way to the bottom, you will see a link to their discontinued products. And when you open that up, you can find all of their discontinued products over the past how many years. And from there, basically what I have done is kind of go through and see which ones are actually profitable because when it comes to discontinued products, um, there is a reason that products are discontinued and sometimes it is low demand. So when I say discontinued products, that doesn't mean every single discontinued product is profitable, but it is a very good way to go through and sort out the ones that are. So there are a lot of brands that just list out all of their products. Um, and it's an easy way to kind of get a bolo list together, if you will. So. Part two of that is the next time you're sourcing at any of your local stores. Um, and I've seen this especially with grocery stores and sometimes hardware stores. I want you to look at the price tags a little bit closer. Some stores, now not all of them, but some stores, if you can find them, will directly mark their products with a discontinued mark or a Sharpie or a different label. It could be a different color. Um, and it might just be as simple as they like put a little D on the price tag. And I've been fortunate enough is I have a lot of stores around me that have that inventory check. And if there is a product that is being discontinued, they mark it. And that's how I'm able to kind of keep track of some of those products. Um, so I can kind of go in, check the aisle, see, see what ones are discontinued. Maybe they're not profitable now, but it's something to keep an eye on in the future. So that's another easy tactic to kind of see what's standing out in the aisles. Um, a third method is using eBay. Used this from the very beginning of finding these products. So when I was, you know, listing the, the Kyrdex 71, um, there were obviously other sellers selling that product. So if you go and look at the sellers, and they're selling a discontinued product. I bet you that's not the only one that they're selling. And you can go through and say, oh, like the, they're selling this, they're selling this. And you can start putting together a list. Oh, like that, that one looked familiar. I might have sold it in my other store, whatever that is. So you can put together a list that way. And then also with eBay is a lot of sellers will list their products with discontinued or hard to find or rare. And it's as simple as going on eBay, typing in, you can do discontinued toothpaste. And then every listing that is discontinued toothpaste, you can go through and see what's selling and see which ones stand out and kind of cross-referencing from what you have at local stores and from what you're seeing on eBay. And it sounds a little crazy, but the more you look at those listings and sellers and products, it, uh, you start to notice things that stand out and this last method, like you might be thinking like Zach, like, what are you smoking? Sounds crazy. But if you look for products that have dust on them, it is a game changer and you can hardware stores, pharmacies, I'm telling you, if you can find ones with dust on them, scan. Them. So short story, I was at a local grocery store of mine going through the house, just kind of sort, you know, scanning this and that. I found this Calgon powder laundry softener. And I mean, it had the thickest layer of dust and there was 30 boxes and each box was six bucks and they were going for like 
50 on Amazon. So I was like, oh, like I struck gold. So I threw them all in the cart. Like, this is awesome. Like they, every single one's got dust on them. Go through the aisle, uh, the checkout. And the lady was like, you can't buy, you can't buy all these. Like other people are going to want this. I was like, man, like, like there's, there's a clear layer of those have been sitting in there. And I even went back and looked at the data. I was like, man, these have been sitting on your shelves for lately, at least seven or eight years. Um, so manager came out, I was like, nah, man, like, I can't let you buy all these. You can only take half. So I was like, you know, I tried like, man, like, come on. So I got half. I was like, I need these. I'm getting these. So I went home. I grabbed a pair of glasses, got a hat. But I got a, a different pair of clothes on. I got, I think I threw something else. I think I had like a wig or something too. Like I was going all out. Came back in the store, got the other 13. I got out. So I was able to get all of them. But it's the dust, man. If you can find products that have dust on them, uh, obviously that means they've been sh- sitting on the shelves for a while. And uh, you never know what type of gold you'll stumble upon. How about the, the stories in the break room of that store? You know, they're sitting there on a coffee break going, you know what? We haven't sold any of those in nine years. And then in one day, two different people come in and clear the, clear the show. Amazing. It's uh, honestly too, it's like the opposite sides of the spectrum. That, that was the only issue that I've had. And then I was just in a pharmacy two weeks ago and, uh, the guy in there, he was like, he's like, oh man, it's been on the show for, he's, he's been on the show for a while. And I was like, you know what? Just take it for free, man. Go ahead. I appreciate it. I was like, thank you so much. But like some people, they just want to get it moved and other, they just attention. That, that always boggles my mind when they don't want you to take inventory that's obviously been there for a while. I have, but, uh, oh, well, uh, so that was a, that's a good, that's a good example. But other than that one and your first win, uh, what's been your most successful product find out, out in the wild? So I remember this one, like it was yesterday. Oh, so it was at the same pharmacy that I talked about finding that cream before. Um, so instead of me being in that pharmacy and basically scanning literally everything in that store, I snuck in a few shelf pictures on my phone, uh, so I could go back and kind of look at them. So I got the pictures and it was later at night, opened up the phone, opened up eBay and I was going back and forth trying to find out what products were profitable. And I saw this one bottle, it had this faded red label to it. Um, had this weird name. It was called like Nutriderm Therapeutic Lotion. Uh, I was like, ah, oh, man, check it on eBay. Let's see. And I was like, nah, l- l- let me, let me rescan this game. This can't be right. One bottle was going for 200 to $250. Wow. And, and it was like 8 PM. So the pharmacy's closed. I'm like, oh, I started sweating, man. I'm like, I can't, I can't go to sleep. I got the adrenaline going. So like could not sleep all night. Immediately in the morning, got to the pharmacy. I was like, please, please, please. Like, got there. The bottle was still there. Took it out to the cashier. And um, he was like, oh, man. I was like, oh, like no one has bought that in a while. I was like, I think they stopped making that. We actually have another bottle. Do you want that? And I was like, dude. I was like, absolutely. The guy probably gave me the weirdest look because probably never seen someone so excited to buy a, two bottles of lotion. Um, but I ended up buying each bottle for $19. And then I made a sale. Uh, someone bought both of them for $550. Wow. Yeah. And then you can say I was definitely hooked after that. Um, I has I had a couple other finds. So like weird ones, uh, back in the early days, I was really hunting down, uh, denture cushions. So there were like three bucks. You can throw them in a padded bubble mailer and ship them real cheap. And they were going for Fifty, sixty dollars. So once again, you know, got like myself going to a pharmacy and just buying like a couple dentures. Coaches, you get the you get the weird looks because like man, I, I'm throwing fist pumps. Like I'm all excited. Like let's go getting these things. But I don't know, those have been some of my best finds. And just it's a throw the hunt. Hunting those guys. Uh-huh. Now. Is there is there anything that uh, kind of makes the big wins? I guess, different from like the quote unquote, everyday discontinued items that you sell. I think so. I, I don't know what it is. 
to be honest. I think it's just, it's just going into an old store and having no idea what you're going to find. Cause there's times where, you know, I strike out, I don't find anything, but then there's times you find just that one item. And usually I think the ones that excite me more are the ones that I haven't found yet. It's almost like, it's almost like catching Pokemon, like that one rare Pokemon that you keep seeing, but you cannot find it. Um, I think those are the ones that really bring the most excitement for me just because it's one of those ones where I can cross off the list and say, I, I flipped that. And it's awesome. So uh, now you mentioned striking out. So let's, let's maybe flip to the devil's advocate side of this. Mm -hmm. Um, so say like in terms of like the big picture, um, you know, say it, mm -hmm. if a listener's listening to you, listening to this interview and they get inspired, um, realistically, what can they expect to find on their own on a semi-regular basis? Like how, how does this work? Like actually, like, do you, is it better to kind of have retail arbitrage, like just standard stuff and then kind of hunt for treasure on the side or. Uh, talk about the hit ratio or, or, you know, how effective the strategy is. Yeah, absolutely. So I like to think of reselling discontinued products as a niche that you can add to your overall reselling portfolio, if you will. So, you know, products are being discontinued every day. Uh, brands are reformulating or just making room for new inventory. Um, so the, really the big thing is, I would say number one, it depends on where you're located. Um, obviously some places have an advantage other than others. I think rural areas, if you have access to that, um, is a big game changer, especially for RA discontinued products. Um, and if you don't have access to those stores. Um, yes, it can be absolutely harder to find these type of products, but that doesn't mean you can't get ahead of the curve and order discontinued products online if you can catch them early enough. So it certainly, um, depends on one again, where you're located. Um, but two, you can definitely add that niche to your overall portfolio. Um, and all it really takes is one ASIN, um, especially if you're catching them online, uh, to really make a difference in, in your overall profit. I think I already know the answer to this because you kind of touched on it already, but uh, do you believe that you know discontinued products is going to be something that's sustainable for a long time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like I said, I've been doing this probably almost five years now. And yes, it, RA again, it does get tough. So when I go and hit a pharmacy, I'm probably not going to find anything if I come back in another week or two. Um, but it is one of those things that if you can create a cycle and maybe come back every other month and see if there's something new that has been recently discontinued that you can kind of catch up on. Um, it is something with the stores that mark their products or their price tags discontinued um because i one of my grocery stores they have people come in every week and are updating inventory and you can kind of keep track of it that way so i think r8 is yes it is a little tough but it's something that you could add to let's say you're going on a big r8 trip um i don't know a couple couple states away you want to hit a couple states those local stores are something that you can add on to, to your RA trip already. Or if it's just something, let's say you're going on vacation or you're going to a new area. I've gone, last year I was in Yellowstone and in Grand Tetons and had a day where I was able to hit up a couple of those old town hardware stores and pharmacies and see what was out there. And it's just something that I can kind of add on to, uh, to any of the trips that I have. Nice. I like that. Which did you like better, Yellowstone or Grand Tetons? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think Grand Tetons. 
Yeah, that's the right answer. Yeah, yeah. I, I need to get to Glacier though. That's next on my list. Uh, okay, I know that I know that we're we're going down a rabbit trail here. Get to Glacier as soon as you can. It is the most beautiful park I've ever been to in my entire life. It is, uh, it's fantastic. I will absolutely will. So, um, there's been a theme with, with some of your, your examples that you've given so far. So maybe we know the answer to this, but I'll ask anyway, um, are there any particular categories or niches that are better to source when it comes to this community product? Yes. Uh, so two of my favorites. Now, actually, let me take a step back and this can be applied to almost everything. Um, now you think like Lego, for example, I know we call Lego sets retired, but that's discontinued. It's the same thing. Um, two of the areas I like to focus on and, um, that I have the most fun with is number one household. Uh, so that could be cleaning supplies. Um, that's a very big one. Um, another good example is refills. Um, so prime example off mosquito clip on fans, they were, that was discontinued earlier this year. So a lot of people have these fans, right? And they need their refills because they, they don't want to use something new and they, they want to keep using it. So. A, an item to kind of keep an eye out for, for hardware stores, grocery stores, or the clip on refills. And yes, these are discontinued too, but the supply, there's obviously more out there because they're the refills. So that's kind of something to keep an eye out for. If you see a product or a system that's discontinued, you can kind of expand from there and go, okay, is that using anything else to kind of keep going? So there was like, at one point, the uh, Swiffer duster was discontinued, but then, you know, the little pads to use for that, people want that as well. So that's something to kind of think about and kind of turn in a lead into multiple leads. And then my all-time favorite is health and beauty. So as I kind of mentioned before, like companies are always changing their formula um, and sometimes their new and improved formula just isn't as good as the original. And I've seen that with a lot of products where they think, you know, we're going to update it. It might have this new smell or whatever it may be, but their customers are like, no, I, that doesn't work for me. I want the original. And that's just something like people are more than willing to pay extra if you can go out and find that product for them so they can keep using it. And whether Maybe they didn't, the company did update their formula. They also have instances where they're just like, you know, we've had this product for years now and we just, we want to refresh our inventory and there's product specifics. So there could be like the specific danger shampoo, or there's a specific hair coloring, or maybe a specific type of toothpaste that they're just not making anymore. And again, people. If it works for them, they want to keep buying it. And I think that's why health and beauty is probably the biggest player when it comes to discontinued products is people want to keep using their favorite products until they no longer can visit. They, they no longer can, or it does not exist anymore. And I've had people leave me feedback where I've sold them, um, a body lotion. So I have this one here. It's a vino positively ageless firming body lotion. I found this at a local pharmacy for like seven bucks and it'll probably sell for 60 or $70. And I sold one not too long ago and the lady had commented. She was like, thank you so much. I can't find this anywhere. I have no problems spending that money. And it was like, it was a really, I don't know, really reminded me of like, it's not, you're not just overpricing the product and selling it and being done. What you're doing is you're creating a, a system for that person. So they, if there's a product they really want, you're going out one, you're doing the research and going out and finding these products. You have to figure out what you want to go find, where to find it. You're, you're using your mileage, 
your gas, to go out and find these products, your time, go finding it, buying it, bringing it back, packaging it, shipping it, just so the customer can have it with a click of a button. And people are more than happy to pay double, triple the price for that product. And um, it's just something to kind of keep in mind as they're doing these products too. Like you are helping these people out by providing them with their favorite products when they they don't have the time or they just want to go out and find them. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not even sure what the ceiling is that I would pay for those, uh, the balanced dryer bars. Did you guys ever use those where you just, you stick them in your tumbler, your dryer, and they just refill this bar. Yes. It was fantastic. And I don't understand why they discontinued it, but yeah, I, I'm not even sure what, what the, the ceiling is on what I would pay for one of those. So it's funny you mentioned that. I actually Googled that just a second ago while, uh, <laughs> while you guys were talking. Um, cause I, I don't, were you guys, were you guys reselling when, uh, when those got discontinued? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know that, uh, I think at the high point, I, I never got, I never sold very many, uh, but at the high point, I remember seeing them for 125, 150 bucks. <laughs> on Amazon, they were they were nuts. Wow, yeah, no. Uh, I my favorites are are like uh, there's there's like a mental aspect to it too. I because I love the people that uh, when a product has a label change, all of a sudden the product doesn't work. Like it, they didn't change the formula at all. They just simply changed it from green to purple, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden you know you'll have you'll have some old person in the you know the reviews going it drying out my skin now and and i don't know why you guys changed it <laughs> and the along the same lines is even if there isn't a change with that product like you said maybe they change it from green to purple but that green bottle still might be profitable on ebay or amazon or whatever it may be even though there is no change but oh the green one worked for me so i'm gonna buy it yeah, you know, there's certain huh. people that, that step two after leaving that review are going to go hunt it down and, and they're willing to pay a premium. Absolutely. <laughs> That's interesting. Now, I know you've talked about searching on uh, eBay. You've talked about uh, uh, talked about looking at price tags and things like that. Are there any other tools or resources that you use uh, for tracking down discontinued items or, or what to be on the lookout for. Um, and it could be anything, any, anything you can think of other than just old, old, good old manual searching. I think number one is seller amp. I really use for one, just checking profitability and seeing how much I can make for a certain item, but also the storefront searching aspect of that tool is fantastic. I'm kind of able to go through and again, as I mentioned before, if someone is selling discontinued products uh, or a discontinued product, more than likely they're selling others. And if you can find one, especially if you found like an old product where you're like, man, that's been discontinued for a while, that person probably knows what they're doing. Um, so it's a, it's a good way to kind of put together a catalog of other discontinued products to keep an eye out for. And, uh, it really makes it easy to, uh, kind of track those products. Another tool that I use is visual ping, um, basically is a screen monitor. So it'll alert me for any web page updates. So discontinued pages, if any of that's updated, instead of me literally going and check daily, uh, I'll get a little notification saying, Hey, like this was added or this changed or whatever it may be. Um, that comes, comes in super handy. So. Honestly, those are the big two that I use. Um, and I guess not necessarily a tool, but a tip is uh, becoming friends or acquaintances with your local store managers. Because um, if you find the right one, they'll be like, hey, we marked this was this was marked uh, discontinued. Are you interested in this? Or we have this. And those type of connections can go a really long way. Yeah. The, the network, I don't know, it never misses. I, I don't know how many times 
we're going to, that's going to come up on the show. Uh, and the, there's still people who probably are not doing it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one of my favorites. I mean, and that's, Even, that's pretty, that's pretty warm conversation too, because it's not like you're, you're asking to go through pallets fresh off the truck. You know, I mean, this is an easy argument that they're, you're helping the manager out clear an old inventory, you know? Exactly. Yeah, and it's the, it's the way you frame it too. And instead of coming in just like, hey, I'm a seller, I'm looking to buy your stuff. And instead of, I kind of come in like, hey, you know, I kind of provide the service where I'm looking for old products to ship to customers who are looking for these type of items. Is there any old inventory you're trying to look into move? And kind of reframe that with, oh, I, this guy's coming in to help me rather than just, you know, I'm looking to sell your products, this and that. So I have found that that little reframe is, uh, Given me a lot more success. So uh, let's talk about the, the pricing aspect of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, we're talking in Q4 and, uh, you know, the, the current environment is uh, to move stuff as quickly as possible. So it, is there ever a point, talk about the balance between maintaining a high price versus having to, to keep a sell through rate uh, at a decent clip. How does that work? Is there certain strategies that you use or, or uh, best practices? Kind of. I would say, especially for the one-off products, um, that's just kind of something. So I guess there's different layers to this. Let me take a step back. So for the ones that I'm finding at like your local mom and pop stores, um, mainly they're, they're one-off products. So that's just kind of seeing where they're sitting at now. And listing around that that price um if it's something that's recently new and has been discontinued um it's something that i'll kind of keep an eye on to see where i want to sell that so something i'm looking on keep before is if amazon was out of stock before um what was what was that price point and how many sellers you know kind of looking at the data that way and if it's not there now, and I know it's discontinued, then that's something that I can hold on to, uh, considering the expiration dates and everything like that. Um, if I can hold on to that, I absolutely will. And one of my, I guess one of my best wins, not one of my best win of all time was finding uh, Neutrogena anti-residue shampoo. And this was something I found maybe two years ago now. And I remember buying it, buying some, and this was like stock was getting, it was dwindling and I, I held on to it for a little bit longer. And I was selling like a two pack for like 70 bucks and then could not find anything for a while. And then a local bargain outlet came in stock and it hit all over the U S from wherever it was. So obviously sellers increase, uh, price is going to decrease. And I knew like, I, I probably checked a hundred times just to make sure that thing was discontinued and it was, and from there on out, I know when everyone else sounds out that that thing's going to go back up to $70 or more once we get there. And fortunately for me, the benefit of having a nine to five is I still have that cash flow. So that gave me the ability to hold on to that for as long as I needed to. And me knowing that it got to the 70 mark, I was like, that's it. I'm, I'm waiting till the 70 mark and I don't care how long that takes. And it didn't even take a year. It was probably nine, 10 months. It hit that price point. And that's when I know like, all right, I'm cashing out. So if I know if that's like the two big points, if I, if I've seen that profit price point, and I know it's discontinued. Um, that's kind of where I make my decision of, okay, maybe I need to hold this for a little bit longer, or if it's a one-off item, I might just let it rip and uh, move on to the next item. Yeah, I, I was in that first wave of uh, uh, that, that restock of that shampoo. I, uh, I still regret to this day leaving any on the shelf. <laughs> I, I I could not believe my eyes the first time I walked in and I saw like a pack of them sitting there. Like I, I physically got sweaty because I was like, all right, it's, it's came on. Like I got to hit up every possible story that I could. So I was, 
spending very long nights, evenings. I had friends going and hitting up like, like spotters, like just going in every single day, trying to hunt down as many as I could. So yeah, I went all off for those guys. Now, now you talked about, um, you mentioned expiration date. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's something I, I want to ask you about. Um, especially cause you mentioned health and beauty as being one of your favorite categories. Uh, yes. how does, uh, how does the shelf life work? Is it, is it the type of thing where, you know, you research it and if it's still good, it goes on Amazon and if it's past the shelf life, it's eBay or how, how do you work that? Yeah. So, um, one, if it has an expiration date on it, um, if it's anywhere near the expiration date, it's, it's going to eBay, uh, easily. And if, if it's expired, that's something I don't touch. I don't like ex selling expired products. Just, it, it doesn't feel right to me. And I'd rather not have to open up that risk of someone like, oh, you know, it's, it's been expired for a very long time and it, it did something to my skin or whatever that may be. I just don't want to deal with that. So if it's, if it's expired, um, I'm passing. And for the health and beauty products that don't have an expiration date, they all have a lot number. And that's something where I go, I'll either, I can straight up call a manufacturer and just kind of give them that lot number, or they have it on the website of just seeing when the product was actually manufactured. And there is a website and I cannot remember it. It's like cosmic beauty calculator or something like that. But if you search it on Google, it comes right up, but they have all the major brands and you can type in the lot number and it'll tell you when it was manufactured and the best buy date of that product. So it's, if it's within that range, that's something that can easily go on Amazon. Nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with check fresh or is it check fresh and check cosmetic? Never heard of yeah, that. Thank, that thank you. One, so. Check cosmetic. That's what it was. Check cosmetic. Okay. Yeah. Have you noticed throughout the years, is there a certain time of year or some sort of cycle that seemed to be better for discontinued products? I actually have not. I've been asked that a few times, but for me, I guess I haven't noticed anything, but it could be um, product specific. So if you're talking about a discontinued dandruff shampoo, then winter months will be more profitable for that type of product. A type of sunscreen that gets discontinued, obviously the summer. Um, same thing with this off clip on refills. This was extremely popular over the, the summer months. So I think it kind of comes down to the type of product you're selling, just not mm -hmm. overall discontinued products. Okay. Uh, and so another little follow-up I've got here is, do you ever, uh, do you ever look for products that are going to have, uh, short manufacturing runs and uh, maybe take, a you know, take a swing at those, or do you only want products that are, uh, are for sure discontinued forever? That's something that I'm. I guess, experimenting with, I haven't had much okay. experience with that. Um, I, I'm still trying to improve on catching discontinued products earlier in their discontinued phase. Um, mm -hmm. that's something that's just, it's tough and it's just something that I'm just really kind of working on the background because. It is hard. It is hard, like tracking down something that's been discontinued and you can really burn yourself out because I've already done it, trying to track down products, one offs here, here, maybe one here and there, rather than trying to find that one that you know is discontinued early and just buying directly from a, a, a supplier or whoever that may be. Gotcha. And the, the reason I ask is, so something that I have done uh, a couple of times, I don't do it very often, but Every now and again, I'm, I'm feel like doing something, you know, just to try something new. And so I, I ordered, uh, uh, one of the SpaceX starship torches, for example, limited run, figured it would be easy, easy money. And then of course, as soon as mine goes to ship, I get notified that, oh, well, you can buy them again, 
uh, and we're going to, you know, ship out the next batch in uh, early 2024. Uh, you know, so I was just, I was curious how, uh, if that's happened to you. So, all right. Uh, any, any questions that you get asked quite often that maybe we didn't hit? That's a good question. Um, I would say, I think one of them is not necessarily a question, but don't be afraid to reach out to their customer service. It's simply asking if the product is discontinued. Uh, cause a lot of people are like, oh, like come up to me. It's like, it's just discontinued. And all I'm simply doing is half the time is literally going to that manufacturer, calling customer service, say, Hey, I can't find this product. Did you discontinue it? And it's either yes or no. We're like, oh, you know, we had a shortage here. This is why you can't find it at this moment. So, um, it's easier than you think, uh, getting the answer. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then and do you have, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, do you have, uh, do you keep a database, uh, or like a hit list of stuff you're looking for? And, and if you do, wh what kind of size, how many items would be on that list that you're, that you've got, uh, that you're hunting for? What do you mean by hit list? Like if you've, if you've gone through eBay and you found discontinued products or you've done your research. And mm -hmm. do you, you make a list of things you're going to look for if you're hitting the pharmacy? Cause it, it feels like there's two different ways. Either you're, you're, you're going, you're looking at stuff that's selling and kind of reverse engineering it that way versus yes. actually like scanning the shelves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you've done your research, like do you, do you keep a, an active list of things, um, that you're hoping to come across? Yes. So I, yeah, I, I, I Mainly, it's just a, a lot of screenshots um, in my phone. But yeah, if there's anything that I find, I kind of keep a, an active list. And I've come to the point, man, where like, I I can't remember like what I ate yesterday, but man, I can remember what was on that shelf four years ago at that one pharmacy. Like I can, oh, or whatever that one seller was selling. It just, it's one of those things. And it, the more experience you get, looking at the shelves and it kind of goes with any like the more experience you get but the more you start to recognize things that stand out so like when i go to a pharmacy like oh man like i have not seen that before and that's something like i'm gonna go scan that and kind of check the comps on it and it's just the more i kind of keep looking and when i'm looking through those like different storefronts and like it's just one of those things where it just keeps taking mental notes and i take a little screenshot there and it just I don't know. I, I, at this point, it's like, oh, like I can remember that thing that I looked at a month ago, that one store that had that. And then when I'm actually in a store, like there it is, found it, saw it, I recognize it. So the more you start looking at shelves, I'm telling you, the more you'll start to see products that stand out or that look different to you. Or again, like with the dust, it just, it'll start coming together the more you start looking at products. Nice. Yeah. One of the questions I always like to ask uh, people as we wrap up is, uh, you know, over the past couple of months, has there been a, a, a book or a podcast or a blog post that you've read or listened to uh, that's had a, a, a deep impact on you? Man. I really got to think about this one. I've had a lot of, a lot of things recently that have helped me change my mindset. Um, I think one is it was something very simple from the Arnold Schwarzenegger or Schwarzenegger documentary on Netflix. Um, and it was just a simple line of, he was like, you can feel like crap. You can feel happy, but the world doesn't stop moving. So it was like, let's get going. And that was kind of something that clicked for me too. It was like, it, that really, it doesn't matter how you feel or kind of what's going on. You still have control of what you can control and you move forward on with your day. So that was something that, that was something that really stuck with me. 
and I, I can't remember what podcast that I heard it from, but they had mentioned it was just something as simple as envisioning yourself and seeing yourself, I don't know, six months, a year down the line and seeing that person and understanding like, okay, that person did whatever habit that you want to start, whatever, you know, stretching or lifting or running or health or eating better, whatever it may be. But seeing that person who did that every single day a year from now, and then you being able to be, see that person and looking back and just saying, oh, you know, I can see that change and I want to be, I want to become that person. So, so go be it. And it's one of those things where you can use it. You can see yourself now and look back a year ago and kind of see that change that you want to create in the life, in your life. So if there's something you want to do, you can kind of look at it and say like, all right, if six months in the future, I look back, would I regret this decision? Would I regret taking that chance or would I regret not going on that trip? And if it's ever yes, I'm going to go do it because I don't want to regret that. I like so, that. I like that framework. James Clear, right? Every action yeah. you take is a vote for the type of person you want to be. All right. And then, there's a lot. I love all that stuff. And it's Dr. Benjamin Hardy talks about uh, it's, it's kind of like connecting to your future self. You know, a lot of people, their relationship with their future self has a lot of negative aspects to it because they think their future self is far more productive and, and a, you know, much better person. Uh, and it's going to work off that piece of cake that you're going to eat right now. You know, like, um, so he's got a lot of stuff. I love all that stuff. Uh, I love reading about it. Me too. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, it's been great. So we always like to wrap up the show with, with a quote of the day. Uh, and it's for the second week in a row, it's, it's going to be a Charlie Munger quote because, well, honestly, he was, he was a Titan and I think he deserves it. So. Uh, the quote of the week yeah, this week is, if you have enough sense to become a mental adult yourself, you can run rings around people smarter than you. Just pick up key ideas from all the disciplines, not just a few, and you're immensely wiser than they are. Uh, and I chose this quote because, uh, one, I think Charlie deserves two episodes back to back. Uh, but this quote also kind of encapsulates, I think, one of the reasons I really enjoy co-hosting this podcast. Yeah, I get the opportunity to learn from from Chris every week. Uh, I get the opportunity to learn from people like Zach uh, and and all of the guests that have come before. Uh, and I can I can kind of key in on certain ideas that I can implement into my own life or my own business. Uh, and then, of course, I can just leave the things that don't suit me. Um, and so we can also take that idea that we uh, or we can take the ideas that we learn. We can multiply them by kind of weaving them together. Uh, James Altucher style and, and come up with something uh, entirely new. And so I, I hope that everyone who listens can, can kind of do that as well. So uh, Zach, thanks so much for hanging out with us, man. I really appreciate you uh, doing this. I, I know I learned a ton. I hope everyone else did too. Uh, and uh, that's the pot. We'll see you guys on the next episode. Thanks for listening to Clear the Shelf with Chris and Chris. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a screenshot on your phone and share to Facebook, Instagram, or your favorite FBA group. And be sure to tag me and let me know why you liked it and what you'd like to hear more from us in the future. Also, I'd like to give you some free gifts for listening. Head over to rabbittrailchallenge.com and repricerchallenge.com for some free courses to further your business. Thanks for listening.